Welcome. As home sleep studies become more popular, it is important for us to have the ability to understand or have a basic understanding of the sleep study report. Now, this is, um, this is not an evaluation of the technology of the home sleep study, and that's beyond the scope of our discussion today. But basically, uh, most home sleep studies or patients qualify for home sleep studies if they have a high uh, probability of having sleep apnea or any obstructive uh, breathing events or ha they have uh, a minimal amount or no uh, comorbidities. So basically patients with uh, high chances of having sleep apnea with uh, minimal comorbidities such as COPD, heart failure, uh, anything else of a significant atrial fibrillation and so on. Now, firstly, like in any report that you want to consider or look at, make sure you have the right patient. So patient details, um, for example, date of birth, age, name of the patient, and so on, and the medical record number, along with the BMI, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, the next thing to consider uh, is for the patient to, uh, for you to look at the, uh, the amount of recording time versus the evaluation time. Now, the recording time is based on whenever the patient presses the button on the home sleep study and starts their actual recording, um, and uh, this should last for at least uh, more than six hours or more than 360 minutes. Now, there's a difference between the recording time, which is just what the general information recorded, versus the evaluation time, which gives us an idea of the amount of data that's actually useful or interpretable uh, for us to decide whether the patient has adequate uh, amounts of um, respiratory events to, to consider them um, having obstructive sleep apnea. Now, there is a difference as well to consider the next thing to do is in patients uh, AHI versus REI. Now, the AHI is the apnea hypopnea index. Now, this is the number that's gained from most sleep studies, in-lab sleep studies, where the, it's the total number of hypopnic and apneic events divided by the total number of hours of sleep. Now, we're able to ascertain sleep in home in, in, in lab studies as we have the EEG monitors telling us when the patient's fallen asleep. So, this is a lot more accurate. Now, the REI, or what it's also known as respiratory event index, basically gives us the total number of respiratory events divided by the total number of recording hours. So if the patient fell as switched on the button and fell asleep 20 minutes later, an hour after that, and forgot, forgot to uh, switch off the button after waking up for more than 20 minutes, a half an hour, and even an hour, so that the number of hours uh, that are recording is a lot larger, it may falsely look like the REI uh, is a lot less and may be falsely negative. So it's important to take note of that as well. So if you have a patient with high pretest uh, probability and the REI or the AHI number based on the home sleep study is less than five, you may want to consider an in-lab sleep study. The next thing to do is to evaluate the patient and see whether it is uh, mainly obstructive events versus central events as the treatment strategies will differ. Now, if you surprisingly get someone that's primarily central events with no risk factors, I definitely think an in-lab sleep study would be something to consider as, as the next step as opposed to an autopat machine. Now, if they have obstructive sleep apnea, then you can proceed pretty safely uh, in uh, setting them up with an autopat machine with a setting of 4 to 20 or having them uh, come in for an in-lab titration. So either one works. The next thing to consider as well is the ODI, which is the o o Oxygen Desaturation Index, uh, and that has to be generally more than five. That just means the number of desaturations or the drop in oxygen levels of 3% or more every hour. Now, if the ODI is five and the AHI is five and above and so on, that's fine. But at times, this can provide us a clue that the patient has underlying sleep disorder, especially if we find the AHI is less than five or the REI for that matter is less than five, meaning that they got a negative study and you actually had a high suspicion or even a moderate to high suspicion of them having a sleep uh, disordered breathing event. So in these cases, an ODI and ox oxygen desaturation index of more than five may be a clue for you to proceed getting an in-lab sleep study instead. Uh, the next step is obviously making sure that you evaluate the heart rate of the patient and, all these, uh, and if there's any abnormalities, consider further uh, look at that, whether they need a referral to the cardiologist and so on. But a lot of the patients with obstructive sleep apnea, they will have bradycardic episodes uh, due to the bell uh, reflex or the diving bell reflex. 
Um, some practice tips uh, before we conclude. Uh, one of it is if the patient has a BMI generally, and that's why I want to take note of the BMI. If the BMI is above 50, they really shouldn't have a home study. They actually should have an in-lab sleep study. Uh, but if you find that you come across a, a sleep uh, report, home sleep report, and they have a BMI of 50, I suggest then if the patient, for example, is not tolerating their CPAP, to consider an in-lab study. But these are some of the reasons why I would refer a patient to an in-lab uh, titration. One is a BMI above 50. Next is an AHI uh, of above 50 as well. And I generally use the rule of thumb just so that I know I'm dealing with someone with a severe sleep apnea that may not be adequately titrated with an autopat machine. So at this point, you may want to consider uh, an in-lab titration as the patient may require a higher level of support using bi-level um, to, uh, to abolish all their respiratory vents. The next uh, clue as well is persistently low oxygen saturations. Now, I purposely have left this vague as persistently low as is, is, is some, you know, if it's 70% for some patients, 78% for another, uh, persistently at 80% uh, most of the time, and a majority of time, or even a third of the time, and I'm not sure 25% of the time is any less uh, worse than 30% than of the time. So in someone that has got abnormally low oxygen levels and they don't really have concurrent lung disease, for which they shouldn't have had a home sleep study, I would definitely recommend an in-lab study as they may have a higher risk of obesity hyperventilation syndrome, which again will require a bi-level titration as opposed to just slapping on CPAP or AutoPAP uh, automatically. Thank you.